Hello, everybody. This is the lecture for the third lecture in class. <clears throat> and there is um, a mention of chapter 11 also in your syllabus. Uh, your chapter 11 is going over uh, some aspects of presenting your research, including papers. Uh, for chapter 11, I want you to focus in on the introduction because we're going to be focusing on the introduction and specifically the literature review with the annotated bibliography. So you don't necessarily have to read the whole chapter 11 at this point. You can read uh, mainly the parts about writing your introduction. Um, so let's get to lecture three. This is lecture three. This is about research ethics. As usual, as I mentioned before, you are in control of uh, how long you watch the lecture. So if you like shorter lectures, just take a break from the lecture here and there. Um, but in general, I'll, I'll make uh, whole lectures and it's up to you to sort of divide up the parts. Uh, take a break when you want to. So research ethics is a, obviously a huge thing that we need to cover in research methodology. And the thing about research ethics is it's a pretty complicated issue because there's no straightforward answers. Uh, so there's uh, various principles and various things we need to consider, uh, but there's no uh, straightforward answers about what is ethical and what is unethical, except maybe in the extremes. But um, where most research lives, uh, it's not a straightforward answer typically. And one of the reasons why it's a bit complicated is that we have different perspectives when we consider research ethics. Um, so different people are affected by our research and those different perspectives can sometimes be contradicting. Um, so something that might be good for one group might not be good for the other group. <clears throat> so when we think about ethics, we often think about these uh, three populations, if you will. We, we obviously think about our research participants. Research participants are people that we collect data from. Scientific community, obviously, uh, the research and the ethics of the research relate to the scientific community. So not just the researcher themselves, but also just the larger scientific community. And then also society. So we also have societal perspectives on research ethics. So beyond just the specific research participants and more generally the scientific community, just society in general. So you might want to go ahead and uh, think a little bit about this. You might want to think about what are some important things to consider from the perspective of research participants. So maybe pause this video and jot down some of your ideas about that. So hopefully you've jotted down some ideas. Think about the perspective of the scientific community. What are some important things to consider from the perspective of the scientific community in terms of research ethics? So go ahead and pause the video and write down, jot down a couple ideas. Okay, and then the last thing is think about it from the perspective of society. What do you feel are important things to consider in terms of research ethics from the perspective of society? And again, pause the video and take a, a few seconds to write down some of your ideas about that. So hopefully you've written down some of your ideas. This will help you sort of understand what we're talking about uh, here more formally later in the lecture. And the big thing is, I think as you wrote those ideas down about those different perspectives, you'll see that the different perspectives can be, again, uh, sort of at odds with each other. Uh, so something that might be concerning for one group might not be as concerning for another group. And so how can we balance these things is really a lot of what research ethics is about. So how do we do it in reality? So we, in reality, what we do is we use moral principles. Uh, so there are ethical principles that are written out. Uh, there's general ethical principles for research that have been written out. And then uh, APA, so the American Psychological Association, has also written out uh, 
uh, ethical guidelines. Um, some of those ethical guidelines pertain to research. Some of them are about practice, um, so doing therapy, for example. But uh, there is specific stuff about research also. And what's sort of common between a lot of those stuff that's written in terms of ethical research that are guidelines that are used, uh, they have pretty much similar ethical principles or moral principles behind them. So one principle is weighing risk against benefits. So if we essentially ask research participants to take on more risk in the research, there better be a good reason for that. Um, so I, I'm not saying here that you can do anything to people as long as there's a benefit. No, that's not it. Um, people have to consider that if there is substantial risk, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, um, then there better well be a reason for it. You can't just arbitrarily do stuff to people just because you think it's you know, good for your research. Uh, you have to have an argument for some benefits. Uh, we have to act responsible and with integrity. Uh, so we have to be professional. Um, we shouldn't be dis uh, overly lying to our participants. We'll talk about deception later. So in psychology, we often, um, I should say we often, uh, ex in experimental designs where you're manipulating some variable and you give different levels of that variable to different people, uh, oftentimes those experimental psychologists use deception uh, because they, you can't say what you're going to do. So if you think, for example, that <clears throat> uh, red uh, produces more attraction in people versus blue, the color blue, you would not tell the person, well, we're going to we're going to show you um, a red, a per person dressed in red. And we're kind of curious about whether you're going to be more attracted to that person. You wouldn't say that because that would blow the experiment, right? You would, you would influence the behavior. So uh, you don't tell people what you're doing sometimes in terms of those experimental manipulations. Um, so when you do use deception, we'll talk about this later, you have to take some special care with that. Uh, but uh, within the bounds of not blowing your experiment, uh, you need to be uh, truthful, forthright, uh, act professionally towards uh, your participants. Um, seeking justice. So uh, that principle is basically that uh, there's an idea of fairness and responsibility, and in the end, uh, people are treated justly. And we'll talk about these things as we're going along throughout the lecture. And then respecting people's rights and dignity. And I think a lot of times these, especially these last three things, are kind of intertwined in many ways. <clears throat> and so, obviously, uh, we just can't use people for our research. Uh, there's various aspects of their rights and their, dig their personal dignity that we need to respect, obviously. Uh, so we just can't use people for our own benefits as researchers. And again, we're going to be talking uh, about these things throughout the lecture because these things sort of imbue all of the topics that relate to research ethics in general and also obviously in psychology specifically. So weighing risk and benefits, so we just talked about this. So the benefits must outweigh the risk. And what do we mean by risk? So risk can be physical or psychological harm. So risk is just not physical, but also could be psychological. Um, so there is um, some really interesting things here. So like one risk could be the, a treatment might not help somebody or harm somebody. So it could be a medical treatment or it could be a psychological treatment. Uh, obviously, people's uh, privacy being violated would be a risk. So we might not think about that as a risk right, at, right away, but that is a risk in research. Um, so there are people's privacy is violated. Something personal that we've either, either collected about them or from them, uh, somebody finds out. And typically for that one, it's uh, we usually keep, we try to keep our records um, anonymous. And so uh, even though you might have a tracking of a person's name because they might need some benefit, so you might have a lottery, uh, 
For example, so you might have a gift card, electronic gift card that you're going to give away, like an Amazon gift card. And you need to have the person's name to see if they won. And so you need to track those things. But if you do that, you keep those that information separate from your data. Um, so nobody can uh, somehow get your data and then they can see the person's name, some identifying information. Um, so uh, that's a really big risk that we take a lot of effort to avoid uh, in psychology and other, and other research fields too, but we're, we're in a psychology class, so we're talking about psychology. Uh, psychological discomfort also is considered psycho uh, a risk, so psychological harm. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get uh, further into the um, into the lecture here. So benefits, so some examples of benefits to an individual. So this is for an individual research participant. Um, they could receive treatment. So, um, you know, let's say in a psychology context, here's some research and we're going to be doing that research and we're going to try out different types of therapeutic techniques and then people who come into our into our study they get uh, uh, some of those different techniques so probably it's best to have several different techniques to compare each other and then oftentimes we have a placebo group uh, so this is where uh, deception comes into play also um, so you are forthright to people usually um, I shouldn't say usually, you should be. Um, and you would tell them that they're going to uh, be given, let's say, uh, six months of free therapy. Uh, depending on which group they're selected, they'll get different types of therapy. And you're really supposed to tell them that there's a placebo group. So you're supposed to tell them that there's a chance that you'll, you'll not be given therapy. Um, probably the most honest thing is what they call a wait list. Placebo, it's actually not a placebo, it's a waitlist control. Um, so you have people and you say, oh, I'm sorry, we have all the slots are filled in the research, but um, can you put your name on the waitlist and, and we'll let you know if anything opens up. Uh, then what happens is that you do all you do your study and then you see if the person on the waitlist improves as much as people who do the therapy. If that's, if that's the case, then your therapy is probably not very good. Um, that's kind of honest in the sense that you are obviously not giving them treatment. If you're giving them a placebo, you should also inform them that's a possibility. So you might be asked to come and talk to somebody, but maybe it's not actual therapy. Because actually a placebo is a more a rigorous test of whether something is effective. Whether that placebo is a psychological placebo, like a therapy, or uh, whether it's a medical placebo, like a sugar pill, to see if just people's belief that they're going to get better makes them better. It's actually not the thing. It's not the medicine. It's not the therapy. And typically what you do is in medical research or psychological research, if somebody was in a placebo group, you tell them and you say, okay, you know, uh, you were informed about this. And what we're going to do is we're going to give you a whole year of free treatment, you know, free free of this medicine if it's effective, um, or free treatment uh, in terms of therapy. So you're supposed to give the treatment to your placebo people after your study's over. <clears throat> I guess that would be an example of sort of justice. Uh, we just can't use people and say, well, oh, you're in a placebo group. Thank you for being a placebo group. See you later. Thanks. Uh, no, there's <laughs> the justice just thing would to do would be to give them the stuff that would help them for free. Um, other benefits to an individual participant could be learning about psychology. So if you were actually conducting a study in this class, and we can't because of the, the current conditions we're in, um, but if you were conducting a study, you would be um, offering to the research participants a written paper on the study. So what you typically do is you offer to send the participants the actual paper that was produced from the study that they're in. Uh, typically people don't ask for that. I think I, I think in my years of research maybe one or two people have asked for that, but you're supposed to offer it. Um, and then if you are a 
in a four-year school and you're not, but if you were in a four-year school and you were taking intro psych, you more likely than not would be in a subject pool or a participant pool where various people would use you as their research participants. And if the university or college is doing right by the students, they would actually make the students write up something about what they learned after the study. So it shouldn't just be, oh, you get extra credit or you fulfill this requirement and that's it. There should be something that sort of helps the person learn more about psychology because that's a benefit that should be received uh, for the individual participant. Uh, we, again, we shouldn't just use people um, and not give something back to them. Obviously, a benefit from the scientific community point of view is it's a contribution to science. And that's oftentimes what you say to people. I think probably um, a good example of this is the, the recent COVID-19 vaccine. So there was a ton of trials and there was, uh, where I live, there was actually in this community, there was a lot of trials uh, of people. And actually one of my uh, students was somebody who was helping organize the trials and take data from the trials for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so obviously there was some benefit because they received treatment if the vaccine was effective, and it was, uh, especially the Moderna and the uh, Pfizer vaccine. Uh, so they received that benefit, but obviously it was a huge contribution to science, uh, for one, because they're using this um, messenger RNA. Uh, and even though I think messenger RNA for vaccines has um, at least been a good idea for 15 years, this is probably one of the first mass usages of that. So that contributes to the science of MR, uh, messenger RNA and using it for vaccines. <clears throat> and it, it's, it's so much better because it can be developed real quickly because all you need is a gene sequence of the virus. Um, you don't need, uh, you don't, typically for vaccines, you need to learn how to deactivate the virus so it's not um, going to make people sick if you have it in the vaccine. And that takes a while to figure out how to turn it off safely. Um, but in this case, if you just have the gene sequence, you can skip that step. You have the gene, gene sequence, you can actually produce it a lot faster, a vaccine a lot faster than if you had to do it the old way. Um, and also, obviously, there's a contribution to society. Uh, so people who did the trials, they obviously contributed to having the vaccine approved by the FDA. And um, for those people who have uh, vaccinations, it's turning out to be a really positive thing. Um, if we get enough people vaccinated, we actually would get this thing over with. Uh, but unfortunately, we have a lot of people who won't do it. Um, so uh, there's that benefit, too. So uh, participants are benefiting scientific community and also, um, obviously, society. Uh, we might talk about those benefits a little bit later, too. But I think here we see that uh, these things are interconnected oftentimes. Um, so those, those individual research participant levels and the scientific community levels and the societal levels um, interconnect. And that's what makes it um, somewhat complicated thinking about ethical issues. Uh, another benefit is you can get course credit. So some schools, for example, offer extra credit for participation in research. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. I'm pretty sure that we bring this up. But I think before I, <clears throat> I forget about it, um, one of the things about the benefits is it can't be too much. And it's also the same thing here for the money. So there's money. So some researchers pay money. So especially for people who want to recruit what we call a community sample. So they just don't want to do stuff on college students because they're around. They want to have a, a more diverse sample of people from the community. So oftentimes in that research, they'll offer money. Uh, to the participant. So obviously that's a benefit to the participant. Uh, the thing about this is that we, we can't offer too much. Um, so if you offer too much money or too much credit, it actually takes away the free will of somebody to volunteer because it's too enticing. Um, so things may have changed. Um, it's been about a year since I've, I've kind of checked this, but uh, Chafee College um, had a policy um, at least a year or so ago, um, spring of 2020, um, where they wouldn't allow researchers to have students as participants in research if they were giving extra credit points. And the argument was that the extra credit points were too inducing. Uh, 
to the person. Um, <clears throat> and I actually I had a student once, and I asked I asked him, and I said, well. What do you think about this? I, what I, I said, and basically, he said he would do anything for five points. He would push down his grandmother. He would jump out of out of a tall building. He would run across the highway with a blindfold for five points. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of exaggeration here, but uh, basically, the point was that uh, you know, even five points was enough that um, he would do anything for it, and certainly, he would participate in research without thinking twice about it uh, for five points, and so. I think there's a there's a point there um, that if it's too enticing, um, it's actually something that um, we don't want to do because it takes the free will for people. And this might sound odd, is you might think, well, why don't you give people a lot of benefit? Um, yes, we want to give people um, reasonable benefits, but it can't be too much to take away the ability to say no. You know, um, if I offer you a thousand dollars and you're in a situation where you're really poor and you're desperate for a thousand dollars you're gonna do anything for that and so um, we can't do that uh, that takes away people's decisions uh, from a scientific community um, <clears throat> standpoint uh, risk generally are things like wasted resources so part of the review of, of ethics for research is, are you just doing the same thing somebody did a thousand times? Um, if that's the case, then I don't know if we really want to approve this because you're just basically, you're making people do stuff that inherently will have at least some risk and you're just doing it to find out nothing new. <clears throat> Why do we want to do that? And so um, wasted resources. Uh, we don't want to risk repeat something over and over again. We want to use our resources, our time, our research studies to give us new information. And obviously that's a huge benefit in terms of the scientific community is that the benefit of scientific knowledge. And in terms of society, risk, uh, there's huge risk um, in terms of misrepresentation or misunderstanding of results. So a classic example of this is vaccines and uh, autism. Uh, there was a unscrupulous, unethical uh, researcher who published something with made up data um, that said there was a link between vaccines and autism. And then it was uncovered that um, he made up the data <laughs> to basically uh, promote stuff because he was able to make a lot of money um, by scaring people. And so um, he made up the data. It was found out the journal that published the article had to say to everybody publicly that this person made up the data, this article has been rescinded, um, but that the harm of that has been caused. Uh, that was quite a number of years ago, and still we still have this stuff running around. Um, you know, just an example of how something misrepresented can continue. People still think this, even though there's been huge studies, for example, in Europe with, I don't know, at least hundreds of thousands, it could have been millions of, of people, and they looked at this very carefully, and there's no increased risk with vaccines and autism. Um, but you don't hear about that. You hear about the misrepresented stuff. Um, this also gets into pseudoscience. Remember pseudoscience? Um, people make a lot of money off of this. People sell books. People, um, people that speak about this, who say they're experts about it, and just any other sort of pseudoscience thing, they make a lot of money. They get paid to appear. Um, they get a paid to appear to, appear, uh, to speak. Uh, it could be thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or more to speak at events. Um, there's a lot of money in um, fear. Uh, so uh, that's a huge risk. Um, so unethical behavior can lead to things like that. And, and, it, and we see it nowadays with the vaccines and um, uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccines and all the, the weird rumors about it. Uh, I have to laugh about the ones about the, that has metal in it or something like that. And you become ma magnetized and people are trying to stick things to their skin. Guess what? <laughs> you know, the, sur if the surface area of your skin is, you know, pretty big. And especially if you're a little bit sweaty, guess what? Things are going to stick with you.
I'm just kind of laughing as I saw a video of some woman at some uh, government event and she was proclaiming how horrible the vaccines are because it magnetizes you and she tried to prove it by putting something on her. She put something on uh, like her her chest or something like that and it had a broad surface area. Of course, it stuck. And then she tried to stick something, um, you know, to her ear or to her neck, I think. And the surface area wasn't as large there and it wouldn't stick. <laughs> and, she, and she kept on trying it to try to prove that she was magnetized, but it wouldn't stick and it was kind of a funny video. So um, I think we, we kind of uh, have a lot of unfortunate um, current uh, examples of misrepresentations of risk um, and the results of things. Um, it's actually not even results. These are just rumors. The results, if you look at the the data, it's just tremendous for Moderna and Pfizer. Um, you know, over 93% effective, effective meaning that you're not going to um, go to the hospital. It doesn't mean you don't get COVID. You get COVID and oftentimes you're asymptomatic. Uh, but 90, 93 to 96% effective in terms of um, avoiding the hospital being really sick. Um, and the side effects are between, uh, I think, 5 and 9%. And these are mild, mild side effects like headaches and uh, kind of feeling sick, um, like a flu or something like that. Um, so the actual results are, are there. It's just that there's a lot of um, rumors. And I think the root of those rumors are in, the, in this initial misrepresentation of this vaccines and autism. Um, I think that's the root of the vaccine uh, misrepresentations that we see. And again, it all started with somebody who made up data uh, to help serve their own purposes. Um, misapplied results. And this is the thing about research, too, I guess I should mention, is that it's kind of scouts honor. So a lot of researchers, it's really up to you to have that integrity. So if you remember that there was a principle there about uh, integrity and honest, what was it? I want to look at the exact one. Oh, responsible and, and with integrity. We rely on individual research to researchers to act that way because nobody's actually watching them. There's not somebody who's going to watch them do the research to make sure they're not doing something funny with their participants. Um, we There's nobody watching them collect their data and making sure, monitoring their data, make sure they don't change the data or make up data. There's nobody that does that. Uh, so we rely on people that have a professional integrity and to be honest about their findings. And we can see here an instance where somebody was not honest, made up data for their own purposes, and it's caused a lot of harm uh, to people and to society. So um, that's, the, that's the thing about research. We really rely on people to follow these ethics, and when they don't follow them, there can be big consequences that other people pay for. Um, misapplied results. Um, so a good example of this is uh, if you took my um, intro class, uh, you would have heard about this topic. Um, so there's a, a test for psychopathy. Uh, so there's a researcher, I think it's Hare, Robert Hare, and um, he was research, researching psychopathy and uh, basically um, looking at, for example, um, people, it could be people, uh, you know, in prison, he actually studied prisoners, and um, he studied, I think, everyday people. But the thing about prisoners, he was curious if, if prisoners who were higher on psych, uh, sociopathy, I'm sorry, uh, sociopathy, uh, so being antisocial behavior disorder, basically, personality disorder, um, people who are higher in terms of being antisocial, did they, were they more likely to be high in recidivism? So if they were let out of prison, were they likely to commit another crime and be back? And it's not surprising that prisoners who were higher in terms of being antisocial versus those who were lower in terms of their antisocial traits, uh, the ones that were higher had a much higher recidivism rate than those who were lower. That was not a very surprising finding, but that's what he found. <clears throat> and the thing is about research, research is good for predicting general patterns. We can't say everything about every single person. So for example, when you teach psychology, um, it doesn't happen a lot nowadays, but it used to happen a little bit more in the old days, I guess, um, where you would say something in class and then somebody would stand up and say, 
my cousin went through the same thing and they're different. It's like, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> We've never said that we can predict every single person, every single behavior, every single time. That would be silly, right? Um, so we talk about general patterns, general tendencies. This helps us understand the general nature of things about psychology. That's what research is. So this researcher developed, um, essentially it was a questionnaire measuring uh, antisocial characteristics, so sociopathy. And what happened was uh, some prison people got wind of this research and decided that they should use this as part of their parole proceedings. Uh, so typically when somebody goes up for parole, they look at various evidence. I think they get letters from people. Um, they look at whether the person obviously um, has had disciplinary problems in prison. They look at all sorts of things to determine whether they should give them parole. And so um, I think it started out small, but then it spread. Um, so prisons, a number of prisons started using that research tool, that questionnaire to measure antisocial behavior as part of their parole proceedings. And some of the prison boards took it to the extreme. Uh, some prison boards actually have used scores on that questionnaire to deny prisoners parole. And so that would be a misapplication of research results. Uh, that tool was not meant to be a diagnostic tool for an individual. It was meant to be a research tool. Now people are using it to decide major decisions about people's lives, whether they should be paroled or not. And to the best of my knowledge, the, the researcher didn't know this. I think the researcher published it, which is normal. You would publish these things oftentimes in, a, in your journal articles. And somebody just took it and used it for purposes it wasn't intended for. Um, so that's something that's a big risk for society also. Um, I had a personal example of this. I've done research, as you know, when you watch the thing about the possible data sets that you can use for this class, as I did research on transgender identity development. And so I was um, presenting this research at a conference. I th think it was at Long Beach or San Diego. I think it was Long Beach, actually. And it got a lot of positive um, a response. So it was a paper I delivered it live, and and uh, there was a lot of people that came up to talk to me afterwards. And I was like, "Oh, this is great. This is, you know, you feel really good when people are responding well to your research." And I I remember one of the people that was hanging around talking to me. Uh, she said something like, "You know, this is fantastic. You know, I work with trans people, and uh, basically she was somebody who worked in the process um, uh, where people, trans people, if they want to have um, gender reassignment surgery, they have to go through a process um, before they, they can have that surgery. And she was involved in that process, and she basically said, I would love to have your questionnaire because this will help me uh, essentially help determine whether somebody gets surgery or not. And I, I felt like I was kicked in the gut. I was like, oof. <laughs> you know, as, as sophisticated as I should be, um, I didn't think about that. I was like, I can't remember what happened. I can't remember if I brushed her off and said, email me later or whether I told her there. But um, the point I was going to tell her is that you're not going to get this. <laughs> I'm not giving you my questionnaire because it's not intended for that. It's not intended to determine for individual people whether they should get sur they can get surgery or not. That's not what the intent of that questionnaire is. Um, so as researchers... It's, it's a tough thing sometimes. Sometimes we don't think about these things because uh, we oftentimes think about, well, our research is really informing people and will help people, but sometimes the things, the tools we have uh, get turned around on us and um, actually end up hurting people when, when that was not our intent. Um, so that's, that's a risk of, for society also is misapplicating, uh, misapplication of results or of research tools like measurement tools. Uh, benefits, obviously, um, for society if there's improved societal welfare. So if we have people who are psychologically healthier, uh, we have better organizations because of social social psychology and I.O. psychology research, um, people might uh, be led to having more thoughtful and rational lives and 
uh, you know, there's a ton of social psychology research that can help us avoid pitfalls of conformity and obedience. So there's all this potential in research to make society better. Um, and so there are those benefits. Those are some of the major benefits for society. And again, a big thing about ethics is that we're comparing risk versus benefits because the risk need to be justified by the benefits. And it's hard to compare because it's, it's basically apples and oranges. So how do, we, how do we compare possible psychological discomfort for our participants, but the benefit could be that it leads to us understanding conformity better. And that helps us avoid uh, some social problems we've had with conformity and obedience. How do you compare those two things? It's hard to. They're not the same. They're not the same metric. And sort of another problem of, about this formula, sort of weighing risk versus benefits, is that uh, it's it starts off sort of in an imbalance. Just a, it has a natural imbalance. The risks are going to be largely on the participants. Uh, they're the ones that we're doing stuff to. They're the ones that we're having a study on. So they're going to bear much of the risk. Not all of risk. We went through risk for other things. But in general, they're going to bear most of it. And then the benefits are borne mostly to society and society. So the people that are benefiting are different from the people that the risk are being asked to undertake. So this is something that's um, really iffy um, for these studies. And some of the classic studies that sort of show this is um, there, was, there was a lot that we learned from the Milgram experiment. Uh, if you don't know what the Milgram experiment, you probably learned it in your intro psych classes. This is where they had uh, people come in and uh, there was a pair of people who were supposed to be participants. Um, and then the researcher comes out and the researcher says, uh, one of you is going to be the learner, one of you is going to be the teacher. This is an experiment on learning. And we're going to randomly uh, decide who's going to be who. And it's, it's rigged because one of the people that's waiting in the waiting room is actually working with the experimenter. So it's rigged. The participant, the actual participant, is always the teacher. So the learner is, is actually somebody who's working with the experimenter. And essentially what they do is they, they say that the situation is to look at whether punishment improves learning. And they're going to have the learner uh, memorize a pair of words, so like dog, cat, umbrella, rain. And so the teacher will say dog, the learner better remember it's cat that's paired with it. And then the teacher's told that if the learner gets it wrong, they get a shock. And in any Milgram experiment, there's increasing shock. So the more you get wrong, the more shock you get, the higher intensity shock. Um, so um, this taught us a lot about conformity. It showed us at least two thirds of people would shock somebody to um, possible severe injury or death uh, just to learn stupid pairs of words because some researcher who they didn't know told them to. So we learned a lot about conformity and processes of conformity. But if you've ever watched the films of this, the people were put through a lot of psychological discomfort through, through the experiment. Uh, then and also after the experiment, even though they found out after the experiment the guy was okay, uh, he wasn't getting shocks, he was fine. And if you've ever seen the film, it's kind of I don't want to say funny because I don't want to imply that um, an unethical thing is funny, but it's kind of interesting to see because the the participant is just is drained emotionally. Usually, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, they went through heck basically um, going through this. It's, it was very stressful for them. And then uh, the guy pops out of the room and says, "Hey, I'm okay. I didn't get shocked." And the, you can kind of see the person go, "Oh, phew, I'm relieved." Um, and so they knew the person um, wasn't hurt, but um, the knowledge that you would severely harm somebody over um, very small conditions, it's a, it, that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, I would say that most of us would not want to know that. And this, and this makes um, teaching social psychology hard sometimes because uh, 
people always say is, I am moral. I would never do that. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that morals has pretty much nothing to do with it. Um, a lot of moral people do immoral behaviors um, under very small uh, tweaks to the social situation, like this, like the Milgram experiment. The people that uh, went all the way, two-thirds of them, um, they were not immoral people. They were probably good Christian men. That was the original sample. Um, and who their neighbors would say would be great neighbors. Um, but that showed us that the processes, for example, in Nazi Germany, that we all say, well, we would never do this. This type of research shows us we would under certain conditions. So we learned a lot. We learned a lot from that study, but there was a tremendous risk that was borne by the participants, um, and that type of study would be considered unethical today. Um, Stanford Prison Experiment also. Um, so Stanford Prison Experiment, you probably know about it from uh, everyday life, or you might know it from your intro psych class, or if you've had a social psych class. But basically, this is where they took um, Stanford students. They volunteered to be in the study. So they knew it was about prison, um, and they knew that they possibly they could be um, uh, locked up for two weeks. Um, so they set up a prison in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building. Uh, this is Zimbardo study, and then Zimbardo brought them in and explained what the study was, and they screened them to make sure there was nobody that had um, psychological issues that would be a problem. Um, and then they randomly chose whether somebody was a prisoner or a guard. So they were randomly chose a role, prisoner or guard, and then um, then they did it. The prisoners, they, they arrested the prisoners. They actually had the Palo Alto, or I don't know if it was campus police, but it might have been the Palo Alto police actually do an arrest. So they actually went to the person's house and arrested them, um, just like they would arrest anybody else. Um, and then they were stripped and they were given basically prison garb. And they had a, um, on the garb, uh, they had a number. And uh, they were severely punished if they ever referred to them or th themselves or other people by their names. They always were supposed to refer to themselves and other people, other prisoners, um, by the number only. Um, so, you know, trying to uh, basically depersonalize them as prisoners. And then the, the guards were given um, batons, I think, you know, and uh, sunglasses like cops have and, uh, you know, basically a, a guard uniform or a police uniform. And so they did this, and the study was supposed to go for two weeks. They had to end it after three or four days. I'd have to double-check that, but they had to end it very early because it got way too far. Um, the, the guards were too... Uh, abusive psychologically to the prisoners. The prisoners were breaking down emotionally. Um, had to be let, a number of them had to be let out of the study because they were they had broken down emotionally. Um, and so there was a huge uh, risk that these participants went through. But um, there was a, a lot of benefit in the sense that we learned a lot about roles, about conformity, uh, about what people could do again, under very small conditions, how the mistreatment you would do to your fellow, pers fellow uh, person, uh, human being, under just small conditions. Because all these, all these guys should have known, or they did know, that everybody else in the study was a uh, Stanford student also. They were all students. And um, as one of the researchers says, it was just a flip of the coin. The flip of the coin determined whether you were a prisoner or a guard. It had nothing to do with the, something you did. It was a flip of a coin. It was random chance. But you, you still saw guards dehumanizing the prisoners. Um, so we learned a lot about from the study, but it's still unethical. This, that type of experiment could not go on uh, today. So we talked about acting responsibly and with integrity. So we want to conduct our research in a thorough and competent way. Uh, we want to be truthful. Um, so in general, we don't want to deceive our participants uh, more than we have to. So if you do experiments, you do have to hide the experimental man manipulations from your participants. Um, but you still have to know, let, let them know what you're going to be doing to them. 
Um, so if you are going to expose them, um, for example, to violent images, so you might possibly, so one, one condition might be violent images from a movie. Another condition might be like you watch Bambi or something like that. And then they compare whether watching those two uh, different types of films has an effect on your behavior afterwards. Um, so you have to let somebody know that you might see violent images. Um, so you actually have to tell people that. You don't tell them what it's about, um, but you tell them that possibly they might be exposed to these types of things. Um, also, I, I probably should put here in terms of being truthful, and maybe I'm going to do it right now. Um, so deception, but also um, like the integrity about your of your results. So we mentioned this earlier. Uh, we don't have to talk much more about that now, but you know, don't lie about your findings. Don't make up your data. Um, that should be a duh, but I think we have to say this nowadays. Um, and also, we need to establish trust with our participants. So um, we're, we should be honest. We, we should keep promises. We should be ethical. So we can't promise something to them that we're going to give them extra credit. And then um, they do something, and we say, oh, you're, you're a bad participant. You, you don't get this credit. You don't get this money. You can't do that. Um, in fact, um, if you offer money or um, extra credit, Somebody can come in and say, um, when they hear about the study, they can say, no, you still have to give it to them. You can't hold that stuff back to make them comply with you. Um, that would be a huge violation of ethics. Um, so, you know, keep your promises and, and act in an ethical way with your participants. Um, seeking justice, so we want to treat people fairly, so we want adequate compensation. So. If we have participants coming in for our study, we, we should actually be fair with them and give them something for their time. Uh, the benefits and risk are equally distributed. Um, so we talked about, about this before, but like if you have a treatment study and by random assignment, they might uh, be in a placebo group. Uh, you have to tell them that there's a possibility that they will receive, they will receive a placebo. I'm sure that's what they, I'm sure they had to do that for the, COVID-19 COVID vaccine. I'm sure that there was placebo groups. You have to have a placebo group normally to make sure that your, your thing's effective. Um, so you have to tell people, hey, you know, you might get the vaccine or you might not, you know. Um, but what you do obviously is um, afterwards, if you find that the vaccine's effective, then you give it to them for free later um, if they're in the placebo group. Um, so. You do have to tell them that if they're in the placebo group, that, or I'm sorry, you have to tell them that there's a chance. You don't tell them that they're in it. That would affect their behavior, but you tell them there's a chance they could come into it. You do that before the study starts. And then if that thing is effective, you have to give it to them for free after the study. So that's, a, that's a, an example of being just. Um, vulnerable populations, we have to think about this idea of justice for them. So um, institutional settings, especially things of things, places like prisons, and also kids. Um, these would be examples of vulnerable populations. Um, so they have a special risk because of being in vulnerable populations. And so a prisoner, for example, um, we have to be really careful because they're in a context where they're, they're used to having less freedom and doing things that they're told. Um, so there's special risk with doing uh, research in prison. Uh, so for example, you can't give them too much enticement. There's, there's a lot of checks that they are freely volunteering for the research, that they're not being uh, pressured, induced, enticed into doing it. Um, and kids, for example, too. So kids are a vulnerable population too because they can't give informed consent. They don't have the cognitive abilities yet to um, weigh the risk and benefits of the research for themselves. We rely on, their, on the parents to evaluate this, but um, they still are vulnerable because even though parents give consent, that's different. Giving consent for somebody else to do something is different from getting consent directly from them. Um, so when you're dealing with vulnerable populations, there is a, uh, extra scrutiny to make sure that you're not violating them um, and, uh, and using them. 
and exploiting that um, vulnerability for your for your own benefits as a researcher. A good example of a vulnerable population is the Tuskegee syphilis study, which I think a lot of you have heard about. And if you hadn't heard about it before, you might have heard about it uh, more recently because this has come up recently in some discussions of current events. And this started in 1932 and didn't end until 1972. And what I'll say is this is uh, an example of something that we should be uh, collectively ashamed of, that this happened in the United States. Um, so the U.S. Public Health Service, what happened was um, they, they wanted, the government wanted to understand the effects of syphilis. And so what they did is they conducted a really unethical study where um, men, um, in this case it was low SES um, uh, African American men who had contracted syphilis and they had the diagnosis, they actually ended up not treating uh, some of these men. I can't. I, I don't know if they had a control group where they treated and not treated. I don't know enough of those specifics, but certainly there was a significant number of people who um, they knew had syphilis and they decided not to treat it for the sole purpose of seeing what the effects of syphilis was. Um, in fact, they weren't given their diagnosis, so. They were just told that there was something wrong with them. They weren't given a diagnosis of syphilis. Um, I'm guessing they did that because they were afraid if they told them they, they had syphilis and they might actually seek treatment outside um, and actually get treated for it. So this is, you know, when I talk about this, this is pretty disgusting stuff, right? Um, they were given overall medical care, but they weren't treated for their syphilis. Um, and this is after the treatment was developed for syphilis. So. Um, this is, again, just to see how syphilis would affect people. So this went on for 40 years, and you can imagine uh, the pain and suffering uh, the participants went through being untreated for syphilis and uh, the angst and the pain that the family members went through. Um, and it only stopped when the press found out and activists discovered this. Um, it wouldn't have stopped otherwise. So... Um, you know, it's hard to not think about things in terms of current events, but um, this is why a free press is important. So the press has been attacked uh, by by some uh, people, some politicians in the last uh, half a decade or so. Uh, but we need a free press because uh, we can't trust um, people in power. Because uh, when you put people in power without a check, this is the type of stuff that happens. Um, so it's only when this was discovered by the free press that it actually stopped. So this is a, a horrible example of, of people who are very vulnerable. So low SES, uh, African-American men, very vulnerable um, to this deception. Um, probably had uh, very little alternatives to care. And again, they didn't know they had syphilis. So even if they had some sort of alternatives for care, they, they didn't know they had a problem. They, they unfortunately trusted the U.S. Public Health Service to, to treat them, and of course the, the U.S. Public Health Service did not treat them properly. So this is why um, in ethics we, we take a special care when there are vulnerable populations. Another sort of moral principle is this respecting people's rights and dignity. Um, so a big thing here is that we're going to talk about in this class is autonomy and freedom of choice. So I already talked about this issue of offering too much credit, too much benefit, too much money. If you give too much benefit to somebody, you take away their freedom of choice. So let's say, um, I'll use an, another example. If you're in prison and they say, we'll lop off five years from your prison sentence if you volunteer for the study, probably a lot of us would do whatever the study is. We, don't, we wouldn't care what the risk were. Five years of freedom would be a pretty huge benefit, I believe. Um, so we actually take away a person's freedom of choice when we do that. Um, so we want to give reasonable amounts of compensation, but it can't be too much to take away that freedom. It can't be too much. It can't be too much that the person will do anything for that. Uh, informed consent. And so a big part of, you know, sort of psychological research is um, to assure autonomy and freedom of choice is that um, there's informed consent and we always want a written document. Um, if 
we were actually doing a study in this class as we would normally would, but we can't under the circumstances, you would have a written informed consent. Um, so verbally, you're supposed to say what's kind of in it. So you tell the person, this is what we're going to be doing, da, da, da. But you also have it written. So um, there's no question about whether they had an opportunity to understand exactly what the study is about. Um, so in the written form, uh, you talk about all the different things. So you talk about, uh, about uh, briefly about the study, what they're going to, what they personally are going to be put through. Um, so whatever you're going to ask them to do, uh, any sort of exposure to things um, that they might not be anticipating. This could be things like images and things like that, various things. Um, it's supposed to also talk about the risk. Um, so any potential risk are spelled out. And the informed consent should should specify, I should say should, because sometimes I see people don't do this and they they should do this. You need to specify that they can withdraw at any point in time without penalty. So if you're giving them money or class credit, they can they can stop the study and get out of the study anytime they want without losing that benefit. Because again, we can't hold that over their head and force them to do what we want them to do. That that would not be ethical. So this informed consent document would have all of this spelled out, and then you'd have the person sign it and date it, um, just to show that um, they understand it. Um, here, it's really up to them. So we, we've done our part. We spelled out all of this stuff. We've been honest with them. We're laying everything out in front of them. We have a written document to make sure that we don't mess up and forget something if we say it verbally. Um, but, you know, sometimes people just don't read that thing and they just sign it. Um, and what I'll say is that's that's not in our court. Um, we've we've been honest and we had to document. If they don't read it, um, then it's really on them at that point. Um, I'm not saying that we would do unethical things knowing that people don't read these things. Uh, but what I'm saying is that you can't force them to read it. Uh, you try to give them the information. You, you put it in front of them. But um, it's up to them ultimately to read that stuff. And actually, I would... I would tell you never to sign anything unless you've read it too. I think that should be so obvious. But it's really it's really amazing though when you see people they they almost never read these things because they trust us so much. That's something that we need to think about maybe is that uh, people are so trusting of researchers they're not, they're not gonna do a bad thing is that we need to think about that um, and not abuse that. So in terms of also respecting people's rights and uh, dignity is that uh, privacy of information. So we talked about that before. Um, so they, in psychological research, the way I like to think about it is that they're lending us into their personal lives. They're lending us into their personal lives for us to better understand some hopefully important question. And we need to respect that and make sure that the information they give us is never used against them. So, um, you know, when they um, tell us something, it's going to be, for one, confidential. So I do various types of research, and I'm thinking about all these things here. So um, one type of research I do is a romantic attachment. So the romantic attachment data that I said that um, can be part of your project if you want is data I've collected. And so one of the things I tell my researchers, because I had undergraduate researchers, I had undergraduate researchers who were the interviewers, and I had undergraduate researchers who were coders. And what I tell them is that you can't say anything to anybody about anything you see in the recordings, with an exception that we'll talk about here that you can see down there. Um, but basically, um, the example I like to use is... Um, Let's say you interview somebody or you watched an interview of somebody on campus, so it's a student, and this person is a jerk. Um, so they, they mistreat their partners. They're not physically abusive, so let's just take that out. Um, but they're manipulative. They lie to their partners. They cheat on their partners. You know, a pretty bad partner. Um, so you watch this thing or you, inter you have this interview, and then, you, you know, you go off and you go to, to dinner that night. In the, in the cafeteria on campus, and um, you see your best friend kind of flirting and talking and sitting with this person you just saw in the interview or you just interviewed. 
what I tell them is you can't say anything, anything at all to your friend. Not even a hint. You can't say something like, I have a bad feeling about that guy. No, you can't. You can't say anything. You would be breaching confidentiality. Um, in that case, what I'd say is it's up to your friend to detect that they're not a good partner and get out of that situation as fast as they can. Um, so we have to keep what somebody shares with us confidential, except under things such as um, you know criminal activity, especially physical. So in terms of the um, romantic relationship interviews that we gave, the informed consent that was verbal and also written for our participants, it's specified that if you tell us something in this interview that you talk about um, being hit, being physically abused by a partner, um, or a risk, like um, for example, somebody says, you know, he hasn't done it yet, but he, he seems like he's on the urge of hitting me or beating me up, that would be enough for us to act. Um, we would break confidentiality. So what I told my interviewers essentially was, because um, I couldn't watch all the interviews because some of the students were my students, and so I promised them I would never watch their interviews, and I've kept that promise. So remember, we keep our promises. Um, you know, so I, I wanted them to be honest in the interview, so I, I, I just had to tell them that I, will, I promise I will never watch yours. Um, if you're my student, I will not watch it. And so um, I told my interviewers and my coders who watched the interviewers interviews, if you see, if you hear anything like this, um, tell me. And actually what I told them is I said, even if you have a small inkling, so maybe they didn't say that, yes, I think he's going to hit me. Maybe it's like, oh, you know, it's getting really bad or something like that. I said, just tell me. Tell me. I'll watch it. Um, if I feel like there's a significant risk, I should say significant risk. If there's a noticeable risk, um, then I would contact. What I was going to do is I never had to do it, but what I was going to do is I was going to work through the, the school process. So let's go to the school, um, have somebody review this, and it actually might be an IRB person, and then if they thought there was a risk there, we would go to the police um, and report it. Um, and so we had to, we told our participants that we would break confidentiality under those conditions. Um, so again, we want to be honest. So if there are reasons to break confidentiality, you have to tell your participants of that. Um, we warn them ahead of time um, so that they don't disclose information to us, not understanding these things. And then um, uh, we want, oftentimes we want to be anonymous. So confidentiality is simply you don't say, don't talk about, reveal things that you learned in your research about somebody. But and being anonymous takes it another level. Um, so anonymous means that our data have no sort of um, ident what we call identifying information. So no names, but also the identifying information could be things like age, gender, um, could be a class that you're in or a major. So if you collect a bunch of data and you have age, major, gender, and your sample is relatively small, and somebody kind of knows who what your sample is, and if they got in there and they saw somebody was 47 and female, and they were a psych major, and somehow they could make a pretty good guess who that was, that would not be anonymous. So anonymous doesn't mean just not having names. It means having no identifying information. Um, so you can see that the, the interviews themselves, since they're being conducted and being watched by people, it can't be anonymous because there's somebody there. You see the person. So the confidentiality is kind of the level there. But for the data that are stored in files, the data that are stored in files, the numbers of everything, etc., those things are anonymous. And so I, I needed to know who came to the study so I could email the professors and say this person came, give them some extra credit points. Um, so I needed to know who did the study, but that data about who came in and who gets the extra credit, that was totally separate from the data in 
the actual files that we're going to be analyzing with the variables because we don't want those identifying information connected with the actual results of the study. And this, you need to take special care of this too, especially if you give like um, money or gift cards. So in the trans research I, I talked about before, uh, we gave out gift cards. So I um, can't remember how much the gift cards were. It might have been like $400 gift cards or something like that. And so um, one, we told them, you know, this would, this would be a benefit that they could apply for. And then if they wanted to do it, there was a separate way that they would put it in. Um, so this was an online survey. So um, what we had is at the end of our online survey, there was a link to another um, data collection tool uh, where they simply could put in their name and their email address if they wanted to be in the lottery. And those two systems were separate. Access passwords were separate for the lottery system versus the collection of the data from our questionnaire. Um, so we wanted to make sure that nobody could link up the two. Uh, so our trans data has absolutely no uh, names, no emails. Um, since it's a national, it actually could be international too. Um, you know, there's no identifying information. It would be very difficult for somebody to tell who these people are because um, they could be from anywhere across the nation or maybe international. So I, I have strong confidence that our data there is anonymous. And why do you want that? Because again, uh, let's say it's with the trans people and um, somehow the data gets out let's, and somebody gives the data to somebody and they're able to somehow decipher who these people are and there can be um, ramifications for the person. Uh, they could be outed. Um, they could be, um, you know, if they're outed, then their employer might know, their employer might fire them. Uh, people know and then treat them differently. Um, so there's all sorts of negative things that can happen. So we strive to make our data fully anonymous and how we collect the, stor uh, the storage of the data. I kind of go on a little bit about that because that's really important because um, we should always think about the worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that can happen? And we make special guards against those things because we really want to protect people's um, privacy and dignity. Uh, they've, they've opened our, themselves up to us and we need to, the exchange is that we need to protect them uh, in every single way that we can. And we've been talking about risk and I've been, I've been kind of biting my tongue on this a little bit, but I sort of hit, hint at this. Um, it's, it's unavoidable to avoid some ethical conflict. So you might think, oh, there's a bunch of research you can do and it's not that big of a deal and uh, it's, it's fine, it's not big of a risk. Well, there's always a possibility that there's a risk to people. Um, there's some things that you might not be aware of that might set somebody off or make them uncomfortable. You might not, you, there's a bunch of things that you can't anticipate. So we always acknowledge that there's no such thing as no risk. There's always some risk. The lowest level of risk is what we call minimal risk. So minimal risk is the type of risk that you would have in everyday, typical situations. So I'll give some examples here. So um, my romantic attachment interview, I argued to a committee that overviewed it that it was minimal risk. And the argument basically is people talk about their relationships every day. And the types of questions that we were asking were, you know, pretty much in the realm of everyday conversations or everyday things that people considered about their relationships. So there was nothing extra. And the committee basically agreed on this. And so um, that would be an example of minimum, minimal risk. It's something that's not unusual to think about, talk about in everyday life or to be exposed to in everyday life. And then if you have this level of minimal risk, um, guess what? Um, the benefit can be quite small. So if we were going to do a study uh, in this class that you would design a study and conduct it. Your studies, I would, I would overview those things and make sure that they were all minimal risk. Uh, 
because the benefit's pretty small. There's not much scientific benefit. There's not much societal benefit. The benefit is basically you would learn as a student what doing psychological research is. So that benefit versus cost is there. And the benefit doesn't have to be super huge if you're doing minimal risk research. So I mentioned earlier in the lecture that uh, these ethical issues have been codified, uh, basically written down. Um, so these ethical principles that have been thought about by people over the ages and applied more recently to psychological research uh, has been applied to forming ethical codes. Um, so just a really brief history of this. So a real brief history of this is uh, reactions to Nazi concentration camps. Um, because some of the people that were involved in that were um, saying that they were doing research. And if you know any history about this, it's really horrible uh, medical stuff, generally speaking. And so there was a Nuremberg Code, uh, 1947. Um, so some of the principles that were codified there were the weighing the risks versus benefits, informed consent. And then uh, some 18 years later or so, 17 years later, uh, there was the Declaration of Helsinki, so the World Medical Council. So this is, again, thinking about medical research. Um, you would have to have a written protocol, which meant there was a detailed description of what you were doing as a researcher. And that that protocol needed to be reviewed by an independent committee. And what I'll say is that that idea of an independent group of people evaluating your ethics is a big thing that has come out of psychology too. Um, so I talked about, for example, the Stanford prison experiment. And if you've watched the original videos, uh, for example, if you were in my class for intro psych, um, if you watch those original videos, the researchers had, could not evaluate ethically what was going on. They were caught up in the study. They were in the role of the researcher or the role of the prison warden or part of the administration of the prison. Um, they lost their perspective on what was happening with their participants. And so we can't rely on researchers to make their own evaluation of the ethics of their research. They're, they're blind. They, they have only one or two perspectives on that. They can't step back and understand those things. This is why we need independent people to evaluate the researcher because we are biased in our own evaluation. So we can't trust ourselves. Um, and I'm not saying that we're untrustworthy people. It's just that um, sometimes our wanting to do research in the way that we want to learn something that we want to do and to publish things um, doesn't give us the proper perspective of understanding it from other people's viewpoint, including the participants' viewpoint. And then the, the huge thing, uh, more most recently, um, is the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report is basically where all these ethical guidelines are sort of based on nowadays. Um, so this is a federal guideline, so U.S. federal government. Um, so it was, it was very explicit about the seeking justice principle. Um, things like distributing the risk and benefits equally across different groups at the societal level. So, uh, you know, obviously this could be in reaction to the Tuskegee syphilis study um, that was not equally distributed. It was unethical to begin with, but uh, a huge thing in terms of violating the justice principle was that it explicitly targeted the mo one of the most vulnerable populations to essentially use them uh, for the study. Um, you can't imagine that, that it would happen to um, white middle class pe people. If I, if I said that, just, you know, for white middle class, there's no way the government would have did that. Um, so you know, basically they're saying if you think it's, if you're okay to do it to some people, uh, you better be able to say it's good to do it to everybody. And I think if they simply would have did that, they probably would have saw pretty easily they were violating uh, this justice principle. I mean, just from your gut level, you should know it, but uh, if you need that extra punch, um, what if you did it to, to white middle class people in Ohio? Well, probably you get a different answer. <laughs> 
uh, respect for people. So the, the Belmont report uh, laid these things out in terms of autonomy and special protection for those with diminished autonomy. So some of those vulnerable populations we talked about, like prisoners and children. So laying out explicitly uh, these guidelines. The Belmont Report, um, obviously then given those things, it, it emphasizes things like informed consent, uh, the principle of uh, benefits, if I can say it right, I have a speech impediment, uh, but basically benefits basically means that you need to be maximizing the benefits while minimizing the risk. So as researchers, you can't be sloppy. You just can't design something and say, yeah, let's, let's do this. No, your design has to be in such a way that you can tell some committee that, yes, um, I thought a lot about this, and I've done everything I could do to minimize the risk to my participants. I thought hard about this. I've done everything I can to minimize the risk. And I also thought hard about why are the benefits being maximized. Um, so part of that is that you, you're arguing about what your study does to contribute to science, for example. Um, so they actually asked for those things to be explicitly laid out. And the Belmont Report became the basis of various federal laws protecting human subjects. What I'll say is we're not talking about animals right here, and we won't focus a lot on animals in this class, but um, we'll talk about animals briefly a little bit later in this lecture. And uh, based on the Belmont Report, there's been uh, increased acknowledgement that we should have these things called IRBs. So IRBs are Institutional Review Boards. So remember we talked about earlier that we acknowledge that the researcher themselves cannot evaluate the ethical issues of their own research. They're too much in it. So you need people outside to evaluate those things. So institutional re review boards are those bodies. And any sort of institution that has research going on should have IRBs. So any college, any university that's conducting research on uh, human subjects, for example, they should have IRBs. Uh, uh, hospitals that are doing research should have IRBs. Just anything that does research on people should have IRBs. And the, the boards have, they're supposed to have at least five people from various backgrounds. So you obviously want scientists because scientists are pretty much informed about some of these uh, ethical principles that we were talking about, like in the Belmont Report. Um, but also you want non-scientists because what you don't want is you don't want a bunch of scientists sitting around a room and say, yeah, this, this, this looks good. This is for science. This looks good. Um, sometimes non-scientists will be there and they'll look at the same thing and say, what are you people thinking? This is ridiculous. So we don't want to get caught up in our own research world. We have to have non-researchers, non-scientists also on the board. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a good distribution of various uh, diversity in terms of uh, gender and other demographics. So what I would say is that the principle here is that the diversity of your potential populations where you're getting your participants from, your board should represent that same level of diversity at the very least. And I mentioned earlier about non-scientists, but for sure there should be at least one person from outside the institution. So you just don't want somebody from the university all sitting around a room and say, yeah, everything looks good. You want somebody from outside the university to also look at the stuff. Or if it's a, if it's a hospital that does research, um, then you want somebody outside of that hospital setting um, who's not a doctor, who's not a nurse, not in the medical field, to put eyes on it and see how they, what they think about it. So, you know, a big thing here about the IRBs is that you want different perspectives. Because, again, just as much as we can't trust an individual researcher to evaluate the ethics of their study, we also just don't want a group of scientists evaluating the ethics of sci these scientific studies. That would be dangerous. And then oftentimes, if you're in a university or college setting since, Quite a few studies uh, do have students as participants. We also want student, at least one student there. So at least one student who can give the student perspective. And the responsibility of the IRBs is that they are supposed to assure that all ethical principles and codes are met. 
Uh, but again, we should remember that these things are not straightforward answers. And so um, what I'll say is that the, the sort of the, the minimal job is that the IRB is supposed to consider these ethical principles and codes in relationship to the studies that they are presented. Uh, but what I'll say is IRBs are not impervious to making incorrect decisions. <laughs> I know that was a weird sentence, but they make mistakes. Uh, so uh, I think I'll talk about this maybe a little bit later. I have an example of this a little bit later, but I was in a situation where we weren't formally an IRB yet. We were actually in the process of forming an IRB for uh, community college district. And there was a study that was going to be done on staff members within the district. And um, I'm, I'm glad that the, the, the chancellor of the district said no to the study until we looked at it. Because it had been approved, it had been approved by another university, so by people who were outside of the college. And when we got uh, the proposal at the district, we were like, "Holy crap! I can't believe that this other IRB approved this." Um, maybe, maybe that's the thing about perspectives that they they didn't really care. They just thought, "Oh, that's somebody else's staff members." And but when we looked at it, we thought this would be um, very potentially damaging to our staff members. Um, and we said no to it. Um, and so I'm um, telling you the story um, to let you know that IRBs try to do the best job they can, but I, I will say that they don't always make the correct decision in, in terms of my perspective. Uh, minimal risk, so we already talked about that. Um, so in terms of the codes, the code for minimal risk says um, it's, it's minimal risk is the type of things that would be encountered by healthy people in uh, sort of everyday life and daily life um, or routine physical activities. So you can actually make somebody do jumping jacks um, or walk for five minutes because that's assumed that people are supposed to be doing that routinely. I don't know if that's true nowadays, but that would be an example. I know there's, there's some studies where they actually have people do jumping jacks for three minutes or something like that. Um, and again, this is, you can always turn this down if you are fearful that this would damage you. Um, or things like physical examination, so things like drawing blood, um, potentially injecting you with things, um, could be within that realm of minimal risk. And then um, the code for psychological research is APA, so American Psychological Association. So there's a, a ton of ethical codes. There's um, more than, uh, I should say, it says approximately, approximately 150 specific ethical codes. A lot of it has to do with clinical pro practice, but there's some for research. Uh, obviously, we can't go over everything, including the research stuff, even though that's a smaller subset. But here's something that, some things that APA specifies. Informed consent. Um, so, uh, usually it's a written document. You need to detail all of these things, so the procedures, the risk and benefits to the person, um, and in general. So sometimes you say that the, the risks are um, you might feel um, uncomfortable by some of the questions that are asked, um, and the benefits could be, you know, benefits are that you'll receive extra credit in your class. Um, you can also ask to um, receive written uh, report on the research when it's completed so you can learn about it more and there will be a benefit in terms of science uh, understanding some of these issues better something like that uh, then you have to specifically say that they have a right to decline or withdraw in whole or part so in whole means they can hear about it and they say oh, nope I mean I'm not gonna do this um, and in part it could be uh, like when you give questions um, it could be either interviews or questionnaires, you are supposed to explicitly tell people um, you don't have to answer every question. You can leave a blank or you can just simply refuse not to answer that question in the interview. It's okay. Um, so that's in part. So they might, might not answer some questions. Uh, sometimes people think, um, oh my gosh, don't tell them that because they won't, they won't do it then. But you know, the truth is that most people do it. I'd say maybe about two to three percent of people don't answer some questions. Um, 
yeah, as a researcher, you get a bit maybe annoyed and say, okay, I got to throw out this whole person because they didn't answer one question. Um, you know, that that is the case sometimes. Um, but we can't violate uh, their freedom uh, just because we don't want missing data. And it's inconvenient for us to have missing data. That's not how it goes in terms of ethics. And we have to let them know if they decline things, um, they don't lose the benefits. So that's the consequences. So there should be no consequence to your walking out or not answering some of the questions. We can't hold the, the money, the extra credit, whatever benefit we promised to them uh, to force them to do stuff that they don't want to do. And then we want to inform them explicitly the limits of confidentiality. So I talked about that with the romantic attachment study, for example. Uh, and usually what you do is you say the basics orally, because you do want to make sure you emphasize these things orally. But of course, you want the, the complete written form uh, to be sub, uh, shown to them, allow them an opportunity to, to read it, and then they sign it and date it. Uh, the thing about informed consent, uh, sometimes you don't need it. So sometimes people do more observational studies in the natural world. And in those contexts, they don't need informed consent. Um, so for example, context of ordinary activities. Uh, so some examples here. So if it's something that's public behavior, typically you can't uh, or I shouldn't say can't, you do not need informed consent for public behavior. Um, and you can actually um, sometimes manipulate people. Uh, so sometimes we have naturalistic observations. So I had one student at one college um, who wanted this, this kind of, a, maybe it sounds like a silly study, but um, uh, she was curious if uh, people's amorous behaviors differed uh, daytime versus nighttime. And so what she did is she went to the coffee shop in the college, so the college coffee shop, and she would watch couples. And um, she would watch, she watched half the couples that she was naturally watching in, in the daytime and half at night. And she had a coding system about touching. Um, so where, how many times they touched and where. Um, so like touching the arm um, was not as intimate as touching the thigh, let's say. Um, so she, she sat there and watched people in the, in the coffee shop on campus, um, touching each other, <laughs> essentially. That sounds weird the way it's like to said it. Um, but it was public behavior. Uh, so there was no informed consent. And I don't think we debriefed. Um, so we haven't talked about debrief yet. But debriefing is where you uh, explain to the participant about what the study is about, etc. Uh, I think also with the, those public behaviors, you don't also don't need to debrief them. And I kind of thought that was the best choice because I thought that the student might get into arguments if um, she went up to people and said, oh, by the way, uh, I was watching you for my class, my, my psychology methods class, and I was watching you touch each other and rating how uh, amorous you were. Um, I just wanted to let you know that. I just wanted to debrief you. I thought, <laughs> I thought that might be a weird situation uh, that might cause extra discomfort for the participants and uh, the researcher might get her into some hot water with people if they if they sort of felt violated. But um, I, I felt comfortable about the ethical decisions there because it was public behavior. Um, if you don't want somebody watching you touching each other, uh, don't do it in a coffee shop. <laughs> go, go to a private place. Um, I would say, you know, if it was um, watching somebody with... Um, uh, what do they call that, ultraviolet or whatever, that's, uh, I'm probably misremembering the words, uh, night vision goggles and you're, you're spying on them from a distance. On, they're sitting in a park bench on the dark uh, and you're using night vision goggles to watch them. That, to me, would be a violation of privacy. There would be, I would think, a, a relatively decent expectation of somebody um, in that situation that they would have some privacy, uh, that nobody would be looking at them in a lit coffee Shop? Probably not. You shouldn't have that expectation. So uh, another example, too, is um, using different teaching methods. Um, so uh, let's say you have a professor, and they have two sections of the same course, and they're curious if, if they do a different thing. Uh, 
um, with one class versus another to try something new and whether that would help students learn, they can do that without informed consent. They don't need to go to you and say, okay, uh, this class is one of my two classes and I'm going to randomly assign you to a treatment condition where I try something new and then my, my, the other one will be just the way I normally do it and just I want to see what happens. They don't need to do that. Um, however, if they're seeking justice, and I would say that if the manipulation that they tried, the new thing that they tried, either um, made learning worse or better for that group, they should s seek justice. So if what they tried, the new thing they tried, bombed, and students got poorer grades because of that, they better give the, those students extra credit. That would be the just thing to do. Or vice versa, if it went really well, but your other class, which you didn't do the change, didn't do as well, you better give some extra credit points to the ones that didn't do as well on your traditional method because there's no fault there of the student. It was your teaching that changed the behavior of the students, and they should not be penalized uh, by those differences. So if you were seeking justice, you would um, give points to people to seek that justice. So deception, we mentioned this a little bit earlier. So there is a principle that we want to um, have integrity and be professional and be honest with our participants, but for people that do experiments, I don't do experiments, so um, I sort of avoid this ethical issue because I'm very honest with my participants what's going on. Um, but you know, there are legitimate experimentalists who need to deceive uh, their participants because they can't say what they're going to do because it would blow their study. And so um, things that we deceive people on is um, what the study is about. So like the Milgram experiment, the, the deception, there was many parts of deception in the Milgram experiment, but the Milgram experiment, it was deceptive uh, in one part because the experimenter said, well, this is about learning, punishment and learning. No, it wasn't. It was about obedience. Uh, so they were deceived about the nature of the study. Um, they were also deceived in the Milgram experiment um, in terms of confederates. Confederates are people that work with the experimenter. So sometimes uh, they have, people have confederates, and the confederates are people that the participant thinks is just like them. They think it's somebody who walked off the street that's also another participant. That's another form of deception. Um, there's another form of deception. There's lots of forms of deceptions, but these are just examples. Uh, we might give false feedback on performance. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we might do in experimental studies is that we might see how people react differently to negative feedback and positive feedback. And so oftentimes what they do is they do false feedback manipulations, which is basically, uh, you might have some task, let's say it's a maze. So you give the person a maze and you say, okay, go uh, solve this maze as fast as you can and you time them. And so it doesn't really matter what the person did. You know, they could be super fast, super slow. It doesn't really matter. Uh, in this type of a situation, you're going to get false feedback. So regardless of how well they actually did, you give them one of two conditions. One condition is positive. You say, oh, you know, you did really well. Uh, you were faster than 90% of the people. So you're in the 90th percentile. You're in the top 10% of people who did this maze. So oh, I feel good about myself. Um, the other condition is usually negative. So in the other conditions, like, oh, okay, <laughs> oof, well, you know, 90% um, of the people that did this maze did it faster than you, so you're in the lower 10%, uh, so deal with that. Um, so, you know, but again, it's not based on the person's actual performance. You're giving them false feedback. And you're seeing how that feedback affects uh, certain reactions and certain behavior. Um, so that's deception. But the, the good thing about these deceptions, in a sense, is that you tell people later. So you don't let somebody leave your study, for example, thinking they're in the bottom 10%. You say, hey, listen, you know, as part of the study, I had to lie to you about this. Um, you actually did really, I, th I, think, I think you're just supposed to say you did average or something like that. I don't think you're supposed to boost them up necessarily falsely. Um, you know, you can just say, well, it doesn't really matter. The, we actually don't know how fast people are. Um, we just gave you what's called false feedback. So um, don't, don't put too much into that. 
And you're really supposed to tell all sorts of people the positive. So you're going to say the similar thing for them, too. Um, the thing about deception is that some people um, say, some people are fairly extreme, I'd say, say it's never justified. Um, I think most people um, in psychology and in APA code specifically is sort of this too, is it, it's okay if it's needed, if it's not too extreme. Again, you go, you put these things through an IRB. So uh, most IRBs have, um, in addition to you submit like a document that describes your study and everything you do and all the questions you're going to ask of the participant, everything, everything that the person's exposed to and everything you do to them, you detail it in a, in a like a document. Uh, but then there's um, another document, a form you usually have to fill out that goes along with that uh, longer written document, which is specific questions. And most IRBs have a specific questions about deception. Is deception going to be used? How, what is the deception specifically that you're doing? Why is this justified? Um, so it's not just um, you decide it's needed. You have to justify it to the committee, also to the board. Um, and also the APA says, and it, most of us also agree that you need to debrief the person as soon as possible. So you can't, you can't sit there and say, um, well, you know, there's all these students in class, the same class that are going to be in my study. I don't want the other people telling them what I'm doing. So I don't want to tell them until after my study is done. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't make somebody um, sit in their room for two weeks thinking they're in the bottom 10% just because you don't want to risk that somebody's going to say something. Um, you need to do it. As soon as, you're, as soon as your data collection is done, as soon as you've done everything to collect your data to run your study, then you need to tell them the honest truth. Because you want to minimize any uh, damage that you've done with the deception. Um, and what you do is, the, the reasonable thing you do is when you debrief and you've used deception and you don't want your study to be blown by other people knowing what you're doing is you say, hey, you know, I, list, I know that you're in this class and there's a lot of people in that class that's going to be doing this study. Can you please don't tell anybody? Because if you tell somebody what I'm doing, it's really going to ruin my study. It's going to ruin my results. Um, you know, so please don't, don't tell other people. I'll tell them after it's done. Don't worry. I don't know what's going on, but don't tell them beforehand because it will really ruin everything for me. Uh, you might not say it so dramatically to the person, but basically you say something like that. Let's think a little bit about, I just want to make sure, I just, I'm not sure what that blank thing is there. But animal research, um, again, we're not going to talk a lot about animal research. Uh, for one, just because I'm not very well informed about it. Um, also, it's... Um, probably even more complicated. Uh, so as complicated as research with human subjects are, I would say maybe the ethical issues are even more complicated with animal research. And in psychology, we do different types of animal research. We do some things that are very um, non-invasive. So some people actually might observe animals in their natural setting. Um, some of these settings could be labs. Um, so I don't know if this is still true today, but at least several years ago, there was a, an island or two off of Puerto Rico that was owned by the federal government, so relatively small islands, but those islands were actually set up as primate research labs. Uh, so they were actually jungles, you know, island jungle, uh, jung, you know, jungle on an island, and the monkeys uh, were running free. Um, but, you know, there was cameras and blinds and other things that were set up to um, do research. And also... Um, Unlike with the wild monkeys, since they were pretty easy to track, they had tracking devices and identification things. You could grab the monkey once in a while, uh, do something to it if you wanted to. Um, I don't want to make it seem arbitrary, but you know, let's say that you wanted to isolate it from peers for a week. You might isolate it from their peers for a week. Or you might, um, if you're curious about some sort of drug, if the drug works or changes the behavior, you might do that. Um, so there's various manipulations that could be done. So it's not naturalistic in a sense that naturalistic is you don't do anything, you just watch. Uh, these were actually labs where you could actually do some manipulations, uh, but it still is in a natural setting. Uh, then we have on the other end of the spe spectrum things that are uh, more evasive or invasive. Um, I think it's invasive. I'm not 
it's more of a medical term, um, more invasive, like um, planting electrodes in, in rats' brains um, because we want to see uh, the neural pathways that are conducted uh, during some activity uh, that the rat is doing. Um, so we have a range of these types of behaviors. I'm sorry, range of these types of methodologies in psychology. Um, and so obviously some of these things um, that we do the animals, we would not be able to do with people. And also some of the things that are, you can do, there's sort of a phylogenic bias, I guess we could say. Um, there are things that you can do with rodents, for example, that you can't do with primates. Uh, so fairly recently, over the last decade or so, uh, primate research has been uh, more severely restricted in terms of risk that you can expose the animal subject to because um, primates have been seen as a close relatives to us and uh, if we feel like the ethical principles apply to us we should apply it to the primates but like I said there's a sort of phylogenic bias that uh, you can do some things with other mammals that you can't do with primates um, so I know that uh, for a lot of people's uh, philosophical viewpoint of ethics, that would not match well with your ethics. So um, it's, it's a complicated picture. Um, and this is not just in psychology. This is, this is for medical research and other things, too. Uh, so there's complicated issues. Um, any place that's doing animal research will have a separate IAB for animals. So any university, for example, that has human subjects types of research, which most, most will, will have an IRB for human subjects. The IRB for animals, animal subjects, will be different. Uh, for one, it's sort of a division of labor, but also it's just because the ethical issues and principles are, are in some ways quite different uh, between the two. And so you want people who understand the animal code of ethics, if you will, um, reviewing the animal research thinking about how much else I should talk about the animal stuff. Um, I've known some uh, rat researchers, and um, I mean, I don't really like this person that much, so um, he's a little bit of a jerk, but he would always complain about uh, how much they're under scrutiny versus us. So for human beings, pretty much it's kind of scouts' honors. You know, that we rely on <clears throat> researchers to be honest and <clears throat> honestly tell and honestly tell the um, IRB what they're actually going to be doing with people and they follow through. They only do those things they told the IRB. They don't change something because they want to change it or they have something new and they don't want to bother with the IRB. They, we rely on people to be honest in that. Um, and we and there's no federal agency that comes and, and watches you do human research um, in general. There might be some exceptions with medical but in terms of psycho psychological research, there's never been, any place I've been, there's never been anybody who's come and audited, you know, somebody who's come and watched the researchers to make sure everything's fine. Uh, with animal research, if you do animal research, uh, the federal government will visit you, I think, at least once a year, or it might be every once in six months, I, I can't remember. Um, at least once a year, if not more often, they'll come visit your facilities uh, they'll look at your facilities, they'll make sure that it's well ventilated, it's humane, uh, the animals have enough room for their species, you know, different species need more room. Um, so somebody will come and actually um, inspect your facilities. And the, <clears throat> the way that the, oftentimes these things are enforced, this is both for humans but also obviously for animals, is federal money. So a lot of the research that's done in universities, colleges, and hospitals, too, comes from the federal government. And so basically the federal government says is if, you, if you don't comply with ethical principles, human and animal, you're going to lose that money. <laughs> and that's a big uh, stick. Uh, you know, that's a lot of money. You know, even for uh, looking at just one university, we're talking about um, probably hundreds of millions, if not more, dollars per year for the research. And so um, the federal government has that stick. If you uh, do not house your animals correctly and treat your animals correctly in animal research. And I think that's, I think that's it for animal research. So again, 
we don't want to talk too much about it because I'm not an expert. And uh, our class is sort of focused in on more uh, human subjects. Uh, when you take classes like biopsychology um, and probably neuropsychology too, I hope that your professors review the animal ethics more because in those specific fields, animal research is um, really prevalent, is really used quite often. Uh, another sort of ethical thing we need to think about is conflicts of interest. So in the IRB submission, typically there's a specific question, are, are there any conflicts of interest? And then when you submit your research to, to journals, the journal will also have you um, basically swear on a statement that there's no conflict of interest that hasn't been disclosed. Um, it's okay if you disclose the conflict of interest, but you need to sign that there is no conflict of interest if you have not said anything about it. So what are some conflict of interest? So um, a lot of times it could be money. money. Actually, there's a lot of money there. So <clears throat> there can be uh, money being a conflict of interest. So um, there are corporations that have funded uh, chaired professorships. So what does that mean? So basically, a chaired professor is um, somebody who gets a lot more money. Um, so there's a special fund that they get extra income. And it could be, you know, it could double or triple their, their actual income as a professor. And these are, um, these are based on various criteria. You have to be kind of a top person to get these things. And these are funded oftentimes by outside entities. So it's, this is not coming from the university itself. It's coming from somebody outside who says, essentially, I want to put my name on this chair, and here's, you know, a million dollars per year for it. Um, so sometimes they just want their name, their family name on it, but sometimes corporations fund these things. And guess what? Why do corporations want to fund chair professors? They probably want an edge. Um, if, if it's the medical research and we have a, um, a, a pharma company funding a chair professor, guess what? They probably want that chair professor to do research on their products. Um, if their products don't work, maybe they want to make sure that goes into the file drawer and, you know, nobody knows knows that stuff. Um, uh, but if it works, they want it to be publicized more. Um, so we have to be careful. Money talks, right? So if somebody's getting a bunch of money from a corporation, that could influence the truthfulness of the research results. Also can influence things also in terms of the research questions that are asked. So maybe the research questions are being guided by that corporate policy more than uh, actual really scientific understanding what's really important. So we have to be, we have to be careful of that. Uh, funding the research. So <clears throat> if you publish a study on the effectiveness of medications, then you have to disclose that the research was funded by these pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, the truth is that <clears throat> these types of fundings are, are, are needed. Uh, so we don't want to say that we, we shouldn't do this stuff. But what we, what we want to be careful of is that this money is influencing scientific results and scientific pathways. Um, so we want to understand up front where the money is coming from. Uh, there could be competing money interests. Um, so... By competing money interest, I, I basically say basically this, um, we don't want people to bury stuff if things are ineffective. So if your study is actually going towards a negative direction for this corporation that funded the study, you can't just bury that. You need to come out and say something about it. So there should be no competing interest between the money and the scientific results. And then there was this... Um, thing I, I talked about earlier about that IRBs are not perfect. Um, <clears throat> and so there was this the study that was going to be done on uh, staff members um, in our district, but it was going to be done at, and it was really, it was very complicated. So the person who was doing the research was also a staff member who was trying to get their um, 
I think they're EDDs, so their doctorate degree in education. But they were working working in our district, but they were taking their 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 doctoral dissertation studies at another university, a private university, and we were a public community college district. But we had this person who was um, a staff member, a student, and then a researcher who was going to be researching things. And so we had these complicated relationships because they were a student somewhere else, but they were a staff member there, and they were a researcher looking at our staff. And essentially they were, they were looking at whether um, <clears throat> there was um, basically certain educational policies that were being followed by staff members. And to me, the policy was good. It was, it was a policy that we would want to be instituted properly. So actually, I had no problem with the principle of this is a good thing that we want people to do. Uh, but the problem was is that they were going to do research, and they basically <clears throat> were going to see if there was resistance to this policy. And their sample size was so small because there's only there was only like a handful of people in their department, so the possibility of identifying people was pretty large, just just from probability wise. <clears throat> but also they were going to use interview excerpts, so they're going to inter they were going to interview the people. They weren't going to do like questionnaires, um, which are much harder to sort of identify. They were going to do interviews. And it's like, oh, so basically your data is the interview quotes. So here we have identifiable staff members, and, and we started thinking there's a huge risk with our staff, staff members if somehow they didn't agree with this policy and they were identifiable, they could be fired. And part of the research process is that, you know, you want the research to be public, and so they were going to, this researcher said they were going to share their study with essentially their boss and the college. And on principle, that would be great to make sure that um, things are changed so that people benefit. But it's horrible if you have people who are identifiable who might be seen as problems and as bad employees and who could be fired based on their participation in the research. And so <clears throat> there was all these problems and there was further problems. <laughs> and so uh, this person's who was going to do the research, this person's dissertation chair was married to the president of the college where the staff members were going to be researched. <laughs> so we're like, oh my gosh, this is a huge problem. We were thinking, this is horrible. The, the college president should be independent. The college president should say, oh, I need to protect my people so I can say no. Well, the college president's married to the dissertation, or is the married to the dissertation chair of this person. How's he going to say no to his wife? <laughs> and so <clears throat> there was all these conflicting interests. And uh, I don't know what happened exactly, but we, we basically said that if the study is going to happen, there has to be a lot more protection of the participants um, because it just see, it was such a mess. And um, I don't know why the other university didn't see this. Um, some of it wasn't, I think some of it was not explicit. So the, the conflict of interest of the dissertation chair being married to the, uh, the college president of the place where the research was going to happen, I don't think that was disclosed, I believe, to the original IRB. And we only knew it because of um, inside rumors, essentially, or we knew what was going on. I don't, it was not written in anything written that we saw. This is where we want the, the researchers to be honest again, right? Um, so um, we were like, there's so much, this is such a big mess. Um, I think one of the things that we advise is maybe going to another college district. Um, so one where, um, one, the researcher wasn't a staff person, and, uh, and two, where there was a process of showing interview examples from individual people to the boss of that person. Um, that's not what research is for. <laughs> and so um, there was so many things that had to be disentangled. Uh, there were so many conflict of interest that were there. And also, um, you probably shouldn't do research probably where you're working because there's a conflict of interest there. You have your colleagues. Well, now your colleagues are all of a sudden your research participants. You know, So what's your responsibility there? How are you going to protect people? Or 
do you think it's an open book or one of your colleagues you like a little bit better so you put the more positive interview quotes in and there's one person you really hate you think they're really a horrible person maybe some of the more negative quotes go into your report from them it's they're just a the big mess um, so um, I know that's a little bit detailed but that shows you how messy these things can be um, especially when things are not fully disclosed. I think one of the bigger things was the, the relationship between the, the dissertation chair and the president was one of the things that we were fully like going bonkers over. This is one of the suggestions we were trying to suggest a person to go somewhere else. Go outside, don't, um, uh, excuse the expression, don't shit where you eat. Um, that's sometimes like people say that about romantic relationships. Don't, don't get in romantic relationships with your coworkers because of it ends up being bad, you're going to mess up your work. Um, same thing for this. Don't research the people you work with. It just To me, it seems like that's going to cause a lot of problems. And what's really funny about these things is, again, the people who are doing these things can't realize it. And I don't, I don't know why the chair of the dissertation committee thought it was fine to do research where her, her husband's the president of the college and is the biggest boss there. Um, but maybe they just thought, no, no big deal. Um, but for as an outsider, it was like, holy crap, <laughs> I can't believe you're doing this. And so, again, we don't leave the researchers on their own to evaluate their ethical decisions. And that's it. So um, we'll end with that very complicated example of ethics. So uh, you should have everything that you need for um, the exam, so exam number one is chapters one, two, and three. Um, so I'll talk to you in the next lecture, and good luck on your exam.